you know, real and factual information in the Idaho 4 can easily be found and spoken about. As I was laying down tonight, turned out all the lights, I was very good sleep. Cuddled up with my dogs. My wife is hard at work right now. So I figured I'd get a couple hours worth of sleep before I headed out early in the morning to go get her. But I couldn't. Even with my eyes closed, I thought of the individual that said they wanted to speak me personally, speak upon facts of the Idaho 4 case. Okay, I'm going to. And this is going to split the room and show who's really willing to listen to fact. And those who only want to follow the narrative the hand walks to the guilt of Brian Coburn during the Idaho 4 case. I'm A.R. Hayes. This is a convict's thoughts. This is uncensored. This is real. This is facts. Nobody wants to ever look at the entirety of the picture that begins to form itself when a tragic crime like the Idaho 4 happens and takes the very lives of people like Xana, Kaylee, Ethan, and Madden, who were everyday college students looking to move forward in life. Here we are. We're supposed to find a young man guilty based upon unverified information and even a discovery of evidence that prosecution has never finalized and turned over to the defense. But nobody wants to actually talk real and true fact when it comes to the victims and their families, even the survivors and their families. That's considered off limits. That can't be a part of this crime. It could carry absolutely no meaning. This has to be a single man from Pennsylvania that lived in the area for less than a handful of months that hunted and stalked and picked these girls out of the air to commit this type of crime. It couldn't have anything to do with narcotics, especially narcotics when it comes straight down to the family members of some of the victims. We're not talking about one. We're not talking about two. We're not even just talking about three, because we also have to include some of the surviving roommates, their friends, their boyfriends, and their boyfriends' families. So if anybody wants to get into a debate that there's no possible way that narcotics are involved in the Idaho 4 case, you better open your ears. You better open your eyes. And you better hear what I have to say. Because it's right there in front of all of you. Did you know not one parent in the Idaho 4 case of the victims? Not two parents of the Idaho 4 victims. But three of the parents... Maybe more. I haven't found out all as of yet, but I know of three that all have penitentiary prison DOC numbers. Well, four, narcotics. Not just minor. Even though, even though we're going to get to him, it's deemed that he had his charges with an agreement made via a plea bargain Drop to a misdemeanor charge. A misdemeanor charge that states that he was sentenced to 90 days in prison. 
Ben Mogan, Maddie Mogan's father, reached a plea agreement that he would serve 90 days in the penitentiary on a misdemeanor drug charge. And let me explain to you something real quick that should throw up a red flag. And we're going to discuss it, so don't worry. Take a breath and sit back and relax. And if you don't like what you hear, that's because you're a guilter. And you won't open your ears and listen to exact fact. One, misdemeanors do not get prison time. Misdemeanors do not earn a DOC number. Only felony charges are eligible for penitentiary, and only felony charges can be shipped to a prison facility to get a DOC number. Misdemeanors carry the longest length of sentence that you can serve of 364 days max plus fines. You do not get a penitentiary DOC number. Ben Mogan has a penitentiary DOC number because he was sentenced to the penitentiary. However, in his plea agreement for drug charges, not one, numerous, he pled out with the prosecution to get that 90-day prison sentence. Now, his wife, his wife was a different story. She very much, like another mother of an Idaho 4 victim, earned herself time in the penitentiary. She also, also, right before the crimes in Idaho, where her daughter, stepdaughter's life was taken, was re-arrested on more drug charges. Not little ones either. Substantial charges. And somehow, even though she has a prior record and a DOC number, she didn't get sentenced to prison time. And I'm going to speak upon that as well in a few minutes. But just know she has a drug history, and she has a prison record. Now we got to go over to another victim's mother, who I actually advocate for, feel for, and am working to try to help, even though recently she shut me out and pushed me away a little bit, which is fine. I get it. It's a hard time for Kara. She's making some on-the-fly decisions. She obviously, back prior to the Idaho 4 case, had also picked up substantial narcotic possession and distribution charges. Very major. She got cut a break and got put on probation. Now, the sad thing about it is not only did she violate, but she picked up new charges. So she just recently was sentenced to the penitentiary, getting her DOC number. They have her in protective custody. She has not been transferred to a DOC yard. Yet she's not on a jail roster, which means she's most likely at the evaluation center for the Idaho Department of Corrections, getting evaluated, probably getting some rehabilitation and counseling before they decide where they can house her. Now, why does this matter? It's going to tie back to the Mogans in a minute. We know the Gonzalez family is the speaking voice for the Idaho for victims' families, only because the Japans have decided to go on their own way. 
the Fernando family has decided to stay quiet and allow the Gonzalez family to issue statements on their behalf. Now, the Gonzalez family is not free and clear of issue themselves. No, 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 no. Steve's very own brother is in the penitentiary for murdering a drugger. Someone involved within the drug game, he took him off this earth. So he's obviously a violent man serving time. It's been said that even Steve and Christy have had a few issues in their past. I haven't really dug in, to be honest with you, because I've already found enough in the little areas that I've found things put together a pretty a good idea of what might be happening. Now, don't forget Emma. Emma Bates. Happen to be good friends with Dylan and others of the King Road home. Who knows if she dealt or didn't deal, but I know I watched her absolutely commit a felony when she decided to remove narcotics from her person and throw them in a trash can at the police station in a holding room. Caught right on camera for all of us to see. It was obvious as day, so it's not made up information. It's right there, it's viewable. And what's crazy about her, and she's gonna fit into my little tale here in a minute, is her DUI was dropped. Her murder charges were dropped in the state of Washington over some bogus legality of out of jurisdiction when her and her boyfriend were known to be the ones who delivered narcotics to a young man who lost his life. And somehow they skated on that. And now, even with video of them dumping a narcotic in a trash can at the very police station on camera. They're not to be heard or seen again. As now, they're out of view. So if anybody wants to come at me crazy and say I'm attacking the victim's family, it's no, I'm not. I'm telling you the truth. It's not attacking anybody. It's relaying public information that's real and true about things that they've done. Just like me in my past. I did what I did and I have to hold myself accountable and realize that my actions caused reactions from others that could have affected my loved ones in the very way that these individuals got affected. Dylan Mortensen's boyfriend, his father, Jeremy, just got released from the penitentiary again. This isn't his first rodeo. It's not his first woman abuse. Yeah, laying hands on a woman makes you a tough guy. He's done it numerous times and served numerous prison sentences. And he'll be back. He'll be back. He hasn't changed. And I know that for a fact based off the people that he runs with. He'll be back. But if you really want to know something that's crazy, he got released from the penitentiary. His own son was on camera making it very well known on the very night the tragedy happened that he couldn't possibly be in Moscow because he is on social media video all the way back in Boise, making sure everybody knows him. You don't fool me, bud. Any wannabe dealer that works for his daddy, the penitentiary, living 
returning, never learning individual has people to help them out. Trust me, I know. One of them got arrested for murdering a couple of witnesses in the case, and he's in direct connection with Jeremy, Quinn Kelly's father. Been friends forever. Very violent criminal. But let's get back to the idea in the Idaho 4 case of an informant that Steve got close to and the FBI said, uh, 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 uh. If you could kind of look through a wide spectrum, just think about it. Think who you never see in the entirety of this case, but one time, and then they immediately disappear. Been very hidden, allowing another family, the Gonzalez, to claim their daughter as their own, even keeping the ashes on a mantle next to Kaylee, using the excuse that they should always be together. You don't think a father that loves his daughter would want his daughter's remains with him? But no, 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 no. You only have to hide for a couple of reasons. An informant can also be known as a snitch. To get themselves out of bigger charges, they will give up information for bigger fish in the pond. Then you have to go in hiding because sometimes the bigger fish in the pond that you give up very much have an army of right-hand men and women that are going to handle business while they're gone. Sadly, people don't recognize the dynamics of the game of snitching, becoming an informant, even a witness. How big of a risk that puts people under. Not even just themselves, but their loved ones as well. Including including their children. Now, what's the difference? We got an informant, we got a witness. Of course, the informant's never going to be known, and they are not going to testify at court. They are there only to feed law enforcement with information. They cannot testify to anything as if they were an eyewitness or someone involved. They stay concealed and hidden as an informant. But their information is very important in catching other, higher, bigger fish. On the other side, you have witnesses. These are people directly involved in a visual sightseeing arena of what's going on. They're not just giving the information in regards to certain people or what they think or have heard have happened for the police to follow tips. They're actually giving information that will cause them to have to testify at trial. A lot of times these people, these witnesses, are actually snitches. They're directly involved in the case themselves but they're willing to pass information along to save their own behinds. Like drug charges on a major scale that get knocked down to just simple probation or even a misdemeanor. Deals are made for snitching. Now, what happens when you have such a dramatic case that ends in the loss of four individuals' lives in such a gruesome manner as the Idaho Four? 
when you've got numerous angles of narcotic issues surrounding the entirety of this case, but even more so, even more so, you have people talking all over the place. Not even just the ones that talked prior to the crime happening. No, but you have more that add to the talking after the fact. It's like a snitch fest in the Idaho 4. I could smell it from far away. Why? Because I've dealt with people and the snitches, the informants, the witnesses. I've been through my own cases that people couldn't stop chirping info all the way around to save their own butts and nail somebody to a crime. Now, the problem I have in the Idaho Four is how legitimate is the snitching to being tied back to the defendant in this very crime? Or was the snitching actually happening to catch real fish? The real players. The biggest drug bust ever in the history of Idaho. And also a 27-person drug ring in the state of Washington that affected not only Washington, but Arizona and Idaho. And these weren't small-scale little arrests. And it took a lot of chirping to make it happen. You don't think... That a few lessons are going to be taught. And then at the end of the day, when you see the court paperwork and the reasoning for sealing the documents, someone's life is still at risk right now. Maybe two people's lives, maybe a handful's. Sure seems like the Mogans found their way into the darkness. And now, even the Gonzalez family, when they speak for Zana's father and sister, they don't bring up the Mogans anymore like they were in the beginning. Did they find out that the Mogans were the informants? Did Ben and his wife, Cora, get thrown to the wolves as the known informants? Hmm. Very interesting. Very interesting. Because many have pointed over that maybe it's Kopaka that was an informant and now he's no longer around. But why would Kopaka be in danger considering law enforcement already nullified him? His danger level is over. But others are still in danger, and some are even being hidden within the very system that they most likely told on somebody that controls that system. It's a scary thought, ladies and gentlemen. That's why I always tell people. I always warn individuals, you better think twice before you speak upon another person's actions. Because it could very much be flipped back around to put you and or your loved ones at risk. I wouldn't want in today's society you're not going to catch me as an informant. You're never going to make me a witness. And hell on earth if I'll ever become a snitch. Because look at what happened in the Idaho 4. And there's a lot of reasoning that's very possibly why it happened. Keep your minds open don't close them down because this is a very complex case that they're working through and they're hiding people to protect them when they're clearly stating 
The man that committed the crime is in custody. So why would anybody still be at risk? I'm A.R. Hayes. This is Convict's Thoughts. That's real. That's true.